And as we've been talking, this is kingdom sustainability. And we've been talking about the kingdom of God and how God is everything that he does is sustainable and has been sustained and will be sustained. Amen. And so we've been coming from revelations 11 and 15, which says in the angel seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. And so last week, um, we had been dealing with um, the natural and the spiritual, and we finished off with everything is sustained by Yah forever. Amen. And so everything that God does is forever, and everything that he does is sustainable. And that because God is in eternity, when he does things, he does things with an eternal purpose and an eternal plan. Amen. And so remember, we read the scripture in Ecclesiastes that said that I know that everything that God does is forever. Amen. And so on this picture here, you can see at the top is heaven. It was supposed to be a representation of heaven. And at the bottom is supposed to be a representation of hell. Amen. And so even when he made us, he made us eternally and he gave us an eternal soul and spirit. Amen. And so it's not really a question of, you know, um, you know, will we die? What happens after we die? We know after we die, we going somewhere. And eternally, we either going to be with him in glory or we go on the way of the pit or going to the way of hell. Amen. And so both of these things are eternal, you know, and so God didn't make nothing with a, a temporary uh, mindset um, because when he does it, he does it forever, as the scripture has said. Amen. And so when we think about the God that we serve, we have to go with the mindset that he is not a haphazard in how he does things and he is not loose and, and, and not well thought out. Amen. And so it's up to us to avail ourselves of salvation that he has prepared for us so that we will not spend eternity in the pit or uh, away from him. Amen. And so today I want to continue going into a little bit more in sustainability. And we're going to really dive into a topic on Solomon's paradigm. I've been mentioning it a couple of times uh, and I really want to dive into um, the truth about Solomon's paradigm and Solomon's model. OK, and so there's a couple of things I want to get to, because tonight I really want to make sure we understand what was not sustainable. Amen. And why did God have a plan for those things? Um, and, you know, and, and why did he do everything that he did? Amen. And so the first thing you can see on here, one of the things that was not sustainable was sin. Hey Amen. We get to Genesis chapter four or chapter three, and we're already seeing sin being mentioned in the scriptures. Amen. And so we know that in this earth and in God's creation, sin was never supposed to be a part of it. Amen. It was never supposed to be a world where people have the option. I'm not saying the option, but were uh, choosing not to serve God, but everything was supposed to be good and everything was supposed to work as a kingdom. And we were all supposed to be worshiping the most high and enjoying the company of each other and just enjoying this world that he made for us. Amen. But because sin entered the world, there had to be a plan for salvation because it's not sustainable. Amen. We can look at a couple of scriptures on that. One of them is Romans 6 and 22. Very familiar passage. Um, if you're not familiar with it, but Romans 6 and 22 just simply says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Amen. And so the wages of sin or the payment for sin is death. Okay. That's the end of it. It's not sustainable, but the gift of God is eternal. Amen. So it is sustainable. It is forever. Amen. So we can clearly see that this is why he put such an emphasis on dealing with sin because the payment or the end of sin is going to be death. But the gift of God is going to be eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. John 8 and 23. <clears throat> and this is what it says. He said, if I be lifted, if we, when we have lifted up the son of man, you shall know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me. Amen. That's not the verse I want. I wanted 24. Sorry. Verse 24. I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins. If you don't believe that I am he, 
you will die in your sins. Amen. That's one of the scriptures that always got me. That always got me when he said that. I felt like that's that's a that's a that's a powerful scripture because some people don't want to believe in Christ. They just still want to just be a good person and they just want to say, Well, I can serve God and not have to believe in Christ and all of that. But he says right here, if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Amen. And again, God's plan was for us to be sustained in glory and for us to not dwell in sin. Amen. So we can see clearly in the many scriptures here. Sin was not sustainable. We can look again in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, real quick. And it says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Amen. So in the end, he's not sustaining it. <laughs> okay. It's going to be dealt with. It's going to be judged. Amen. And so I just have here the main theme of scripture focuses on this very premise. Sin cannot be sustained in heaven nor in earth. Amen. There's many different times. Uh, in the scriptures that we see that the Bible says that the sins have reached into heaven. Amen. And it talks about how though at those times, that's when God will come down and he will deal with those things because he's saying the sin that was going on in the earth has been so abundant. It has reached up even into heaven is what it will say. And so we clearly see many times in the scripture that sin is not sustainable and he is never going to be pleased with it. And it will be judged in the end. Amen. Hold on one second. I got to tell my kids to be quiet. Right. Got to deal with the little ones. They being a little loud. All right. What was not sustainable in addition to that? Sacrifices of bulls and goats. Hey, Amen. Because of sin, we needed those. Okay. We needed to do the sacrifices of, bull, of bulls and goats. But the Bible says in Hebrews, it was done away with for a more better covenant. Amen. You can just imagine the amount of meat that was being cooked at that time um, for all the sins that were being done. That's not sustainable. And in, in it, and even in the scripture, it says that it wasn't um, built uh, and it wasn't anything that could actually uh, deal with the conscience of sin. Amen. It was a thing to to offer the sacrifice. But now we have a much more better covenant. Amen. And so Hebrews 9 11 says, but Christ has become a high priest of good things to you by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Now, we're going to get to that because people don't want to believe what the scripture says. Amen. And so that's one of the big things we want to deal with is, you know, Christians, um, you know, one of the problems in Christians, uh, Christianity is that Christians really don't believe the Bible like they say they do. Or we don't believe like we say we do. When we go into scripture, we got to believe what it says. Amen. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures that are pointing to how our beliefs should be really shaped and not what our traditions may have shaped us into. Amen. Verse 12 says, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, but by his own blood, he entered into once the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifying to the puring of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ? Amen. So bulls and goats sacrifices, that was never going to be sustained. Amen. We needed that because of sin. All right. Lastly, and the point that I wanted to get to today, earthly temples were not sustainable. All right. And we're going to look at that tonight. I can just leave you with this to start off with all earthly temples. All of them have been each destroyed eventually. All right. All of them, no matter what culture you look at, no matter even in the, uh, when you look at Israel, when you look at, uh, even in the church, we're going to look at this real deeply because we're going to look at the scriptures and we're going to look at what was and was not sustainable. Amen. There's a reason why God said, no, you're not that you're the temple of the Holy God of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a reason why Paul was saying that, no, you're not that you guys are a habitation. You are the dwelling of God. Amen. Because he's showing you what was sustainable versus what we think is sustainable. All right. And so tonight we're going to deal with the Solomon paradigm. Okay, now paradigm is a word that just simply means model or pattern. Okay, it's a pattern or a, thought, or a, a model of thinking. Amen. The key thing we're going to ask tonight is, is Solomon's model the standard and is it sustainable? Okay. And so we're going to look at um, some teachings that I did um, some years back on the truth about the temple. And it, it deals with the mindset of Solomon and the, and the paradigm um, that was established when Solomon built the temple. Amen. 
And we're going to see how the same model or same paradigm is the mode of thinking for a lot of people that do ministry today. And why, when we look in the New Testament, do we not see a lot of examples of what we do today versus what they did at that time? Because some people think they didn't do it because, you know, oh, well, they were persecuted. They didn't have no money at that time. They didn't, you know, and we come up with these reasons why we don't think they did, because we always want to go in the Bible and be able to substantiate what it is that we do. But in reality, they were very particular about how they approached the faith and what they believed and what they did. And I'm going to show you not only in the scripture, but also historically why they did ministry the way they did it in the New Testament. Amen. Because I, I know that it is a breath of fresh air for those who understand it and learn of it. Amen. And you're going to see what they did was much more sustainable and was much more um, long term thinking and also which much more mimic the mind of God. Amen. And so I'm coming here to the teaching on does God dwell in temples made with hands. All right. Now that's the scripture in Acts 7 and 48. The scripture comes from Stephen when he's preaching and we can go there real quick. Acts 7 and 48. <clears throat> now, now Stephen is getting this from Isaiah. We're going to deal with all this tonight. Verse 46 says, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Now he's, Stephen is preaching. He's going through a discourse and he's basically summarizing Israel and the movement and the law and the prophets, what was going on, right? And he's doing that to surmise it up until the present time that they're at, showing that the promise of the Holy Spirit and that the promise of Christ had come, all right? But in order to do that, you got to go on the law and the prophets. You got to be able to prove and and kind of work through that and show people like, look, Christ didn't just show up by happenstance. This isn't some random guy showing up on the scene. Everything he did was prophesied to happen and he's fulfilling prophecy, amen? And it says here in verse 47, but Solomon built him a house. And we're going to deal with that. And he says in verse 48, how be it the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as said the prophet, okay? Because that's already in the scriptures. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? And what is my place of rest? Hath not my hands made all these things? Ye stiff neck and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. <laughs> Amen. So that's the thing that we don't want to do. We don't want to resist the Holy Spirit. We don't want to resist what the move of God was and what he was establishing. Amen. Because one of the ways we do that is by uh, upholding our own traditions over the leading of the Holy Spirit and also over the word. Amen. And that's one of the biggest things that we have to deal with, with tradition. Amen. And that's why Christ had such a difficult, <clears throat> difficult task dealing with the Jews because he was coming up against their tradition. OK, so we're going to walk through this. I'm going to be expedient because there's a lot of information on here, but I'm going to make sure this is very uh, efficient and how we go through this. Amen. <laughs> so we got to understand the plan of God. All right. We need to really look at this holistically, um, looking really at the plan of salvation and looking at historically what really happened in the Bible and what uh, and we can, from that, we can kind of surmise what God's plan and what his, his will actually was for the sons and daughters of God. Amen. So in the beginning, we know that in Genesis 1, the Bible says everything was good, okay? And that God had a desire to dwell among his people and even have a relationship with them even back then, all right? In Genesis 3 and 8, Genesis 4 and 26, say that, okay, where it talks about that, you know, you see God coming in the garden, always talking with Adam, talking with Eve. The Bible says that he walked through the garden, amen? And so we see God establishing man and woman, and then he's dwelling among them. Amen. He's he's making his habitation them and the place that they are at. Amen. And we see the beginning and the end of the Bible ending with the same notion. All right. When you go to Revelation <clears throat> chapter 21. <clears throat> we see the same thing again. <clears throat> And it says, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God or the dwelling. And we're going to get to that word tabernacle. The dwelling of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. OK, 
<clears throat> now, if this is what's going on in heaven, this is what his plan was. Okay, we're not going through all of what we got, got through, and then we get to heaven, and he still doesn't do what he wants. No, this was his plan from the beginning. He always wanted to dwell among his people. He didn't make the earth and all of us and make all this stuff just to look at. It, it was always meant for him to be in and through his people and dwelling among his people. Amen. And so that is big. Okay, because this these are the plans and the ideas that God had. All right. And what you're going to see in the scripture is many, many times he keeps reestablishing the same thing. He keeps reestablishing a way to dwell among his people. All right. So in the beginning, God already had what he wanted. Okay. A lot of people overlook Genesis, but you can't do that. It was about 1656 years between Genesis one and verse six and chapter six, rather. So God had people already calling on his name. He already had a people that was set apart for himself. That's another word you have to remember, the word set apart. So the most high always has to have a holy sanctified people for himself. Okay. This was always the plan. This was the plan from the beginning. Okay. Genesis 4 and 26 just basically says, and Seth and to Seth to him also was born a son and called his name Enos and then began men to call upon the name of Jehovah. OK, so they were calling on the name of Jehovah all the way back in Genesis uh, and, and Genesis. And again, we're looking at about sixteen hundred and fifty something years going on. Now, that's a long time to be going on and you not having what you want. OK, so we're going to keep looking at this. First question you got to ask, why didn't anybody build God a temple? We're talking about in Genesis. Now they had to do sacrifices too, right? We see them doing sacrifices. We see the Bible say that Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain, right? And I don't have time to get into the actual sacrifice, but no one built the temple. We don't see anybody talk about building the temple to God. Now they built altars. They built places to offer a sacrifice, little spaces, little altars, but no one was building God a temple and saying, you know, we need God to come dwell at this temple. You don't see that. There was no temple. Why wasn't a temple ordered to be built immediately to worship the Most High? Why didn't Adam build a temple? Why didn't anyone else build one? These are questions you have to start asking when you read the scripture. And it's going to start to open up a lot more when you understand what is taking place. Amen. And so we know that when we get to Genesis chapter six, people begin to mix. Genesis chapter six says the sons of God, you know, saw the sons of men were fair and they begin to make, you know, daughters and sons with them. And I'm not going to get into the Nephilim and all of that. Um, but all we can say this from Genesis chapter six, something different happened. OK, we can we can all agree that that happened. Something happened in Genesis six, which required God to call out Noah. All right. And God said that his spirit was not going to be striving with us anymore. That was the key. Noah was righteous and just man. The Bible says in verse 12 that all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. All right. Because why did I say earlier? Sin will not be sustained. Didn't I say that? And so we see God now deal with the corruption in the earth because he's not going to sustain that. The earth can't sustain it. It was made to be holy as well. Okay, the earth was actually made to be holy. Now, I don't have time to get into all the little details with that, but I thank God for it. But sin was not supposed to be sustained, all right? And so we get to after the flood. And again, we see the same thing happen that happened in Genesis. God set apart another group of people to himself. Okay, because he already had a group for himself in Genesis. All right, Genesis chapter three and Genesis chapter four outlines it when he goes through all the lineage of Adam. Adam begot Seth, and Seth begot Enos, and Enos begot Methuselah. Those were all righteous lineages of of people and patriarchs that were serving the Most High. All right, and that's that's and you know that's true because in Genesis chapter three it goes through Cain's. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter four goes through Cain's lineage. And the reason it goes through his lineage is trying to show you Cain's lineage wasn't doing right. But the, but the line that was coming from Seth and coming from Adam, they were doing right. They were calling on the name of the Lord. Okay, so he had a set apart people for himself in Genesis. Then we get to the flood. We get to after the flood. And again, we see the same thing. God sets apart another people for himself. I'm not going to go through all those scriptures. I have a lot to cover. All right. This time it was Israel, but it started with Abraham. All right. Was anybody between the time of Noah and Abraham righteous? Yes. Why? Because they followed the ways of the Most High. Okay. The Bible says that Abraham kept the ways of the Most High. He, and he, the reason he said that Abraham was going to be blessed is because not only did he follow his ways, but he was going to teach his children. He said, I know that he will teach his children also. 
Because see, God is concerned about sustainability and perpetuality and for us spreading the seed of righteousness. Amen. Because he's sustainable in his mind. I'm trying to tell you, I want you to grab hold of this word and understand how God works. All right. Now, this is a timeline um, that I think is very good because it shows basically, um, you know, the timeline of these patriarchs in the scripture and how long they lived. Um, and you can really kind of see how it lines up to history. All right. So at the bottom here, and I know it might be hard if you're on your, your phone looking at this, uh, but at the bottom here, there's a timeline here that says 4,000 BC, 35. So as we go from left to right, uh, we're going closer to our present day. Okay. And so we can see way back here in the, in the beginning, we got Adam who lived 930 years, Seth who lived 912, Enos and so forth. Now, the interesting thing about this that I like is that you can see during the time Adam was living, all these other patriarchs are alive as well. It wasn't like Adam lived 930 years and then begot Seth. No, they were living while each other was still there, right? So that's why it says here, after 130 years, if you can see this, you know, Seth was begotten, right? And then Seth lived as long as he lived, right? And so you can see that all these patriarchs um, were alive. You know, most of them were alive around the same time. I mean, Adam died. Um, yeah, Lamech even would have been alive to see Adam. You know, it says here, Lamech was born here. Adam was technically still alive, amen? And so this is great. Now, you see Noah come in on the scene right here. Then you see Shem, the line of uh, the Hebrew. Then you see Abraham come around here, which is around 2000 BC, okay? Now, you get from Abraham to Moses, all right? Now, look, from the time of Moses, is 1500 roughly BC, and from the time of uh, Genesis, Adam, you're at 4,000. So this is about, you know, 2,500 years, okay? This is 2,500 years. <laughs> and we don't ever see God mention nothing about a temple. We never see him mention anything, even about a tabernacle. Isn't that amazing? And that's kind of what I wanted you to see from this. Because again, when you put things out and show people in a certain way, then you begin to kind of understand some of the thought process. That's 2,500 years. Y'all, we in... It's been 2,000 years, apparently, since the time of Christ. We're only at 2,023. That time period, is, it's longer than that. That's how long it was. And I told you earlier, in Genesis, it was 1,500 years just in the book of Genesis. And so this is a very long time for God to supposedly not have what he wants. Because, again, if, you, if people are in the Solomon paradigm, we think that we can't have the dwelling of God or we can't meet with God unless we build him a temple. Right. We think that the temple represents the center of these relationships and the center of where we are, uh, what makes us uh, uh, who we are. And so this is going to challenge that mindset, because, again, we don't see any example of that. And we don't even see anything being built really in that way until we get to the time of Moses. And when we get to that, it makes a lot of sense. All right. So we get to Moses and it says that Yah commanded Moses to build a sanctuary. This is the first time we hear of a tabernacle is with Moses. This is approximately 2,500 years after Adam. All right. And it says in Exodus 25 and 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments, even so shall you make it. All right. So we see clearly here that God gives a command to Moses for him, for them to build him a sanctuary and a place, okay? Now, this is really, really good because you want to see this. First thing you got to understand is this is God talking to Moses, all right? This is God speaking to Moses, telling him what he wants him to build. That's a key thing you have to keep in mind, all right? Now, what is a sanctuary, okay? A sanctuary is simply a hollow place or a holy place. This is the definition in the Hebrew, all right? It's a consecrated thing or place um, it can it, it is essentially just mean a holy place. OK, so. It is a consecrated thing and it's a thing to be set apart. OK, so a sanctuary can also be viewed as a container for keeping something in. So you can think about a bird sanctuary. Right. It's like a, a place where you go and ain't none but birds in there. Right. So the key thing you need to remember in the scripture, a sanctuary is defined as a holy place. OK. The sanctuary is defined as a holy place, a consecrated place, or a set apart place. All right. These words are gonna come back later in the in the conversation. Right? Tabernacle. The word tabernacle is defined as a dwelling. 
Now, the key thing you have to remember is a dwelling can be anywhere. Sometimes it is actually translated as a tent in the, in the, in the law and the prophets. Sometimes they translate the word tent for dwelling. It's the same Hebrew word. But the key thing you have to understand in scripture is that dwelling can be anywhere. It can be in a building. It can be at a tree. It can be at uh, in you. Amen. And so tabernacle means dwelling. It doesn't have to mean a building. That's the key thing you have to remember because when people see tabernacle, they automatically think of building. And I'm going to show you in the scripture, that's not always the case. All right. It means the dwelling where he is, where he is, is what tabernacle means. All right. So understanding these words, the spirit needs a set apart place, sanctuary to dwell, which is tabernacle. Okay. The spirit needs a set apart place or a holy place, which is the sanctuary to dwell, which is the word tabernacle. These two words, sanctuary and tabernacle, have to be properly understood. The dwelling place of Yah is wherever he ordains for himself to dwell. You can't build whatever you want and call it a sanctuary or tabernacle. This is clearly shown in the Bible. Now, Exodus 10, uh, 15 and 17 says, Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of, the, of thine inheritance in the place, O Lord, which you have made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Okay, so this is the thing that people forget. You know, when we talk about making a holy place, or a sanctuary, the scripture shows us that the most high has to agree to make it holy and put his put his presence there. That's why it says, has made for you to dwell and your hands have established it, okay? And we're going to see another example of this when we get to Solomon, all right? Because again, you can't just go with the mindset, I can make anything I want and make it holy and God going to come dwell there. That's not how it works. And I'm going to show you. It has to be holy and set apart, okay? Now, Yah must make the place holy. The scriptures show that Yah is the one who sets things apart and makes it holy. Only he can make an acceptable place to dwell. This is important to know. And that's not really hard to think about. You know, when you go buy a house or you go buy an apartment or whatever you're going to live in, don't you want to make an acceptable first? You know, are you just going to go up in anything? Are you just going to go and, and lay your head down and there's, you know, garbage all over the floor, and, you know, and it it cobwebs everywhere and bugs walking on you know before you dwell in a place you clean it up you make it acceptable for yourself so if even us as the bible says as christ says if even you who are evil know how to do good things why you know the truth of the matter is he is his place he's going to make it acceptable for him to dwell and that's what you have to remember okay we don't just make stuff and say oh it's holy because i said it is okay Exodus 25 and 22. And there I will meet thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things, which I give thee in the commandment unto the children of Israel. So God is telling them where he going to meet a man. I'm going to meet you here in this tabernacle, in this dwelling that I have given to Moshe or Moses. All right. So here's a, a outline picture of the tabernacle. I'm not going to go into all the details of this. That's not the focus of this particular study tonight. Um, but the key thing, again, is out of all the things that are in here, the bronze altar represented sacrifice, the labor represented being washed and clean. And there's scriptures here that uh, go along with uh, the purposes for these things. Because, again, when God does something, there's a purpose, there's a plan. It's not just, oh, it looks good. Ooh, they had a bronze label. Why? Because bronze is shiny when the sun shines on it. That's not why he did it. These all were representations of the new covenant that was coming. Amen. And they were all symbolic of those things. Not saying that these things didn't mean anything. Not to, not to say that they were just doing something that didn't matter. They were being righteous by following these commandments. Amen. But they had eternal purposes and plans built into the things that they were doing. Amen. And so we know in the holy place, there was the flesh, the body of Christ, right? And then the altar of incense represented continual prayers. And these are just more scriptures that go along with these objects, all right? We see the table of the showbread, which represents the word, amen, in the holy place. Golden lampstand representing light, revelation, and spirit, amen. All these things are unlocked when you read the New, the New Testament. I'm not saying that they didn't understand this stuff in the Law and the Prophets, but I do believe they had some understanding about what these things meant, but when the new covenant is arriving, the Holy Spirit is being poured out. All of these things started to make much more sense to the apostles and those uh, that understood these things. Amen. And then we know in the Holy of Holies, they had the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat, which represented the presence of Yah 
uh, and mercy. Amen. And so if you think about what God called Moses to make, he made them uh, set before him and, and make a dwelling that moved. Okay. It moved around wherever the people of God went, it moved because they had the Ark of the Covenant, right? See how that's a great representation of who God is. Notice how when he gave the design, it was movable. It was moving around. It was mobile, <laughs> you know? And so he is establishing his people and he's saying, guess what? You're going to have the Ark of the Covenant and every time, everywhere you go, you take that. Why? Because I want you to know I want to dwell among my people. This is representation of him saying, I want to dwell among my people. That's why wherever it goes, wherever you go, it goes with you. It's not, it's not the same as a temple because the temple don't move. It stays in one spot. Okay, and we're going to get to that in a minute. So when we see God give Moses the example and the design and the plan for what he wants, it's representation of him. Amen. All right. So um, the holy place, yeah, it was separated by a curtain, a veil. It was like a curtain. It was to cover the holy place in the ark. And this was symbolic of the separation between God and man due to sin, as only Aaron was allowed to enter into the holy place because he ministered to the Lord continually. OK, so there was a separation there in the holy place with the curtain. And only one were allowed to go in there because behind the whole, uh, the curtain was the Ark of the Covenant. And you could not go in there except for one year, which is on the day of, of the atonement. And that's what the high priest was able to do to go and offer sacrifices for sins for, on behalf of all of Israel. Amen. And so that was also a representation of what Christ was going to do because he went in to the Holy of Holies and he offered sacrifice once and for all, for all, for all of God's people. Amen. And so these were all symbolic and they all made sense. None of this was made up. None of this was just man's idea. This is what God gave Moses to do. All right. I just went on to that. The day of atonement was a symbolic work of Christ that he should do on the cross as he made atonement for all mankind. Amen. So. Key things about the tabernacle. It was portable. It moved where God's people moved. It contained things that all had meaning and pointed to uh, Messiah. Hebrews 9 and 10 summarizes the tabernacle very well. You know, on your own study, go and read Hebrews 9 and 10. It goes through all of that. Summarizes everything I just said. Matter of fact, a lot of what uh, revelation of what I just said comes from Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. And I don't think people really understand the significance of the book of Hebrews. If you were a Jew in first century uh, Jerusalem and first century uh, Rome and someone gave you the book of Hebrews, you would probably be ready to hurt somebody. The book of Hebrews is very, very, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's very, very, um, it's very significant. As a matter of fact, if you took the book of Hebrews out of the New Testament, you could almost actually probably say there's some incomplete things of, of revelation that you're missing, because that's how powerful the book of Hebrews is essentially on the on our doctrine for today. Because in the book of Hebrews, it's the one that really kind of puts the final stamp on that we're under a new covenant and that all those things have been done away, you know, like. You get bits and pieces of it through the uh, through letters and epistles, but book the book of Hebrew really just you can tell it was meant to summarize and give you the the to feel confident about moving ahead that we are really under a new covenant and really explaining what all the other stuff meant and what we were what what they meant and why God allowed those things for a time and why we are going where we are going now. Amen. So the reason I say Hebrews would have been a was an amazing book in first century uh, church because some people would have thought it was a heretical writing. That's how, that's how strong it is. And I don't think we may understand that, but because we're in 2023, right. And we're just in a completely different time, but you take a book like that to a Jew and talk about how the, the God is talking about a tabernacle and you know, that he never wanted that. And he wanted a tabernacle to be with men. And it, it's, it, I'm telling you, that's, <laughs> that is on a whole nother level of different and it's it's a it's powerful and it was amazing uh how it all came together amen but we're going to keep going amen because we, we just dealt with the tabernacle now we're going to deal with the temple okay so the solomon paradigm or the solomon model okay and we start at second samuel chapter seven okay we're going to go there real quick and we're going to read this um and make sure we understand the story. Second chapter, chapter seven. 
And it said, and it came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house made of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, go do all that is within your heart for the Lord is with you. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, thus said the Lord, shall you build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but I have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. All right. And all the places where I have walked with all the children of Israel, did I ever speak a word? with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, why build ye not me a house of cedar? <laughs> okay, so you got to listen to what is being said here. Okay, so first off in verse five, he said, you're going to build me a house of dwelling now. You know, the translation there is, David, you know, you, you got blood on your hands. You talking about you want to make me something holy. <laughs> you know, so are you going to build me a house of dwelling? Okay, that's the first question. David wasn't qualified to do that. All right. Then we get to verse eight. Now, therefore, so shall you say unto my servant, David, um, I'm sorry, verse seven, in all the places that have I walked with the children of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribes whom I commanded, saying, why build ye not me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, you shall say unto my servant, David, thus said the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from the following the sheep to be ruler over my people over Israel. And I was with thee wherever you went, and I have cut off all thy enemies out of your sight and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people and I will plant them that ye that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as aforetime. And as since of the time I commanded judges to be over my people, I have caused them to rest from all thy enemies. Also, the Lord telleth thee he will make you a house. All right. So now God is saying the people are at rest. All right. And they're not moving around anymore, even though, again, the temple or the tabernacle represented really what God was doing. I'm dwelling among my people. All right. Amen. This is what it says here. Now, a lot of people miss this part. Verse 12. And when your days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers and I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, hold on, wait a minute. His kingdom forever. Now, was that Solomon? I will be his father. He will be my son. And if I can, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But the mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, who I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So now we're seeing here, God is already thinking eternally. <laughs> He's already thinking long-term and sustainable. He's like, this is going to be forever. All right. You're thinking about a building and I'm going to get to the building in a minute. But what I'm doing is I'm establishing a throne that will be established forever. Amen. So that's what we need to be focused on. I'm focusing on the throne. What is he establishing forever through the lineage of David? Amen. And this is what he was most interested in because this is what's sustainable. This is what he's going for. And this is what the plan of God was. Amen. And so we see something greater here than what we have typically looked at. Because we think this is just about David saying, I want to build God a house. But look at what God flips it to and says what he wants. All right, because he said earlier, I ain't never asked for that. Have I ever asked y'all to make me a house of cedar? And I can give you a little bit more insight into this if you don't know. But building temples to gods was not new. Um, there is many, many examples of other temples built to other gods well, well before any of us seeing any example of a temple being built by Israel. They built gods to Nana, to Ishtar, to all of these other deities all the way back to all the way back to the time of Abraham even before that they were already doing that okay we already know in ancient Egypt they were building temples okay they were building temples and, ded and dedicating them to God so you got to understand this not only does David look at Israel and say look we can beat all our enemies and look at God he's dwelling in a tent made with curtains he's dwelling behind animal skins but I'm looking over here at these other nations and looking at the temples that they got and I'm looking at this like our God is greater than that. 
and, and be honest with you, you know what? I can I can see why David would say that. And I can see where his heart was. And that's why I believe God said what he said. We're going to get to what he said. Amen. Because in his heart, in David's heart, what he felt about God was much greater than what he saw God dwelling in. He's like, I'm dwelling in this nice house of cedar, but the most high is dwelling in a curtain. Amen. And so, and then on top of that, he's looking at other nations and you can see how they're treating their gods that they serve and how elaborate their temples were. And they're, and they're looking at this like, you know, our God is, our God is way better than we got the God. We got the King of Kings, you know, why is our God in a tent? All right. And so now you got to think how they were thinking, where the mindset was. All right. So that's second Samuel chapter seven. And in summary, Israel had rest. David had a desire to honor the most high with a better dwelling. God's desire went beyond a temple, which we just read. He was thinking ahead. He wanted to establish something that would last and that he needed a throne and a lineage to bring Christ through. All right. And there's more scriptures there outlining that. Right. So we get to first Kings chapter five. We see Solomon begin to build the temple. I'm not going to go in all those scriptures, but here's just a picture that kind of represent what it may have looked like. Um, and you can see, you know, when Solomon did what he did, it was nice. You know, it was exceeding magnificent. That's what the Bible says. And it was, yeah, things dwelled in gold. He had to get items from all over the world and different things like that. Um, the key thing that I want you to see, matter of fact, we got to look at it just real quick. Let's go to second Samuel chapter five, because there's this one point that I want to bring out. Uh, chapter yeah first kings five nine seven kings sorry about that first kings five so the big thing that you want to understand when you take away from this let's go to first Kings seven when we go through all these temple furnishings I'm not going to go through all this what you need to understand here is you never see God say, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> you read all of this. This is what Solomon did. Okay. It say he went and got all this stuff. He did this. He did that. He made it with this. He went and got all that stuff. It's very different when you look at Moses' example. When you look at what God told Moses to do, he told him exactly what he wanted. When you get to the time of Solomon and you look at the paradigm that he was doing, he was building this temple the way he wanted to build it to represent who he served. Amen. And so it was different. It's not the same thing. And I think people need to make sure you really understand that because this is different. Okay. He's putting in all these different items. He's getting things from all over the world. He's getting pillars done. He's getting gold put in. He, he you know, he's getting uh, all, all types of stuff that's being done. And it's all being explained here in Genesis. I mean, it's uh, Genesis first Kings chapter seven. All right. And so that's really kind of what I want to make sure you understand when you read this. Because, again, there's a lot of scriptures. I can't go through all these scriptures. Okay. But, again, this is what he did. Right. Then we get to 1 Kings 6 and 11. Now, while he's doing all this stuff, God sneaks in again and speaks to him. This is what he says. Concerning this house which you are building, if thou walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto God my, to David thy father. All right. So you see God coming in like this is cool. But guess what? Walk on my statute, keep my judgment, do all that stuff, because this is what I really want. <laughs> OK, because the temple is cool, but this is what I want. All right. Get to Solomon's dedication in chapter eight. I'm not going to go read that. All right. Then you get to first Kings nine and three. And this is what it kind of all comes together. All the things I've been saying before about the temple and holy and everything. This is when you see God say, I'm going to bless this place and I'm going to dwell there. And the Lord said unto him, I've heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. And I have hallowed this house because why? Only God can make something holy. It wasn't anything Solomon did to make it holy. He made it. God told him, look, if you do my commandments, keep my things, I will dwell in this place. All right. And he said, I have hallowed this house, which you have built. And to put my name there forever, because if he going to do it, <laughs> he going he gonna to do it forever because everything he does is forever and sustainable. And my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. So what he said is I hollowed the place. I'll put my name there and my eyes and my, my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. 
All right, because as I said earlier, only God can set apart and, and hollow a place for his presence. Okay. Verse six. But if you at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve the gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land, which I have given them, and this house, which I have hollowed for my name, will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. And at this house, which is high, every one that passeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss, and they shall say, why hath the Lord done this unto this land and unto this house? OK, so we see here clearly this temple was conditional and it represented relationship between God and man. And he allowed them to do it on the condition that they kept his commandments, kept his statute, kept his all everything else. Because, again, as we go back, we never see any other example of that. We don't see anybody else doing this. So we know David had it in his heart, as the scripture says, to build God a house because this is what he wanted to do for his God. And I get it and I understand it. And I think it's beautiful and there's nothing wrong with it because God said, guess what? I put my name there. I'll hollow it out as long as you keep my commandment, as long as you do what I say, because guess what? I'm not interested in having no building that looks great, but don't nobody serve me and do right. I'm not interested in, in, in uh, all the pomp and everything looks great, but everybody's disobedient and nobody keeps my commandments because that's what they ended up doing. They ended up doing exactly what he said not to do. All right, so we know that Solomon did wrong any day. I did wrong anyway. And in verse chapter 11, he says, albeit I will not rent all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son, David, for my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Because he was already thinking ahead. He knew he wasn't going to do right. That's why he gave the commandment. And that's why he said the first time, I'm going to establish my throne forever through the line of David. And that's why it says here, the most high left one tribe for the throne, which was from the line of David in the tribe of Judah. This was to allow for the Messiah to take the throne and to build the true temple of God, which he was talking about earlier, which we read. Christ had come through the line of Judah. So the most high couldn't cut off the lineage. Not yet. All right. So again, he was already thinking sustainably. He was already thinking long term and eternal. And he already had a plan of salvation for his people. He was working out the temple model was just something that he allowed as relationship <clears throat> and because of David's heart and his desire, but it was conditional on the fact that they had to keep his commandment. <clears throat> and so then we start seeing these prophecies come to pass and come to life from the prophets. Okay. They continue to say that Christ is going to actually build the true temple. Zechariah 6 and 12 says, and speaking to him saying, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying, behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall grow up out of this place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. And he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule and the throne will be upon his house. And he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between both of them. All right. So prophets begin to prophesy <laughs> who going to really build the house. Isaiah, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear. And he shall be for a sanctuary for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Okay. <clears throat> Lastly, Ezekiel 37. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant and I will place with them and multiply them and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Now that's the key. Sanctuary is what? It's the holy place. I'm going to place the holy place in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle shall also be with them or my dwelling. I will be their God and they should be my people. Because again, this is what he wanted. He wants the tabernacle or dwell with his people. Same thing we saw in the beginning. And so as Yah said, the temple was destroyed. The Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Solomon's temple approximately 400 years later, 587 BC. It says it back there in 2 Kings 24 and 3. They carried out all the stuff out of the place. Okay, so they destroyed it. It wasn't sustainable. As I said earlier, you're going to see all the temples that were built were destroyed. All right, because they're, that system or that model is not sustainable long term. It just isn't. All right, so Christ reveals the true temple of God. We flip over to the New Testament. Christ said, and he said, if I destroy this temple in three days, I'm going to build it up. And they looked at him like he was crazy. Now, how are you going to build this whole temple over again? We in the 2000 some years, we, we built it. He said, I'm going to build it back up again. <laughs> and the Bible says, but he spake of his temple, the body. Mm, mm, mm. 
And this is what is being fulfilled from what the prophets were actually saying and what God was actually saying all along. That's the true temple of God is the body. And he says, I'm going to build it up in three days. I'm going to raise it back up, right? When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which he said. Now they had to finally believe it. They had to finally believe that the body was the temple and that he was raising up the true temple as the scripture says, because they apparently didn't believe it at first. They were like, now in the world he's going to believe, how are you going to do this? And it says here clearly, they remember after he died and he rose from the dead. And they then remembered the scripture and the word that he has said. Amen. So you had to believe it too. The apostles believed it and preached it. This is the true temple. This is prophecy fulfilled. It's not a light thing. Okay. Because a lot of people think this is just, no, they just, they just talk it. No, this is not a light thing. This is scripture fulfilled, prophecy fulfilled. And this is thousand years in the making. And what Christ did was amazing. All right. Matthew 24, he reveals the true temple. Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. They wanted to show him all of, you know, the stuff. And Jesus said unto him, see not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. But I say unto you that in, in this place is one greater than the temple. Now that's, that's, that's a public enemy, a uh, bad thing to say to Jews <laughs> because they believe the temple was where God dwelled. That's how they believed. That's why they didn't like that. When he said stuff like that, they were taking up stones ready to throw it at him because they believed that the dwelling place of God was in the temple. He says, in this place is one greater than the temple. All right? So, understanding the words, remember, the spirit needs a set-apart, hollow place to dwell. All right? Hollow place is sanctuary, dwell is tabernacle. These two words, sanctuary and tabernacle, have to be understood. The dwelling place of God is wherever he ordains for himself to dwell. In the new covenant, we are made clean for the indwelling of God. It's all going to start coming together now. In the new covenant, we are made clean for the indwelling of God. Christ erected the temple, true temple, his body. His body is us, the believers that are set apart, hollow, and sanctified for his dwelling. Okay, so the body, the believers, we are set apart, made holy, and so we can be sanctified for his dwelling, all right? We are called first, invited, bid, and we are chosen, elected, eclectos, which is added to the ecclesia, the called assembly, which means called out people to the church. The word is usually just, you know, translated as the word church in the Bible, but the word ecclesia means called out peoples. It means those who are called, the people who have been called out, set apart. And the called out people in the scripture is called hagios, holy, which means hallowed, or that sometimes is, uh, it's translated as the word saint, or the word hagiagazo means sanctified. So you can see how all this comes together. For God. So we are a called people, elected, called out, made holy for God to dwell in. <laughs> it's the same thing he was doing in the beginning amen that is what he wanted from the beginning we can't overlook this he already got what he wants all right scriptures know you not that you are the temple naos which is dwelling of god and that the spirit of god dwell in you if any man defile the temple of god him shall god destroy for the temple of god is holy which ye are okay because again god needs a sanctuary to dwell in a holy place. And we are the ones who've been made holy to dwell in. So this is what he wants. Amen. First Corinthians 6 and 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have have God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with the price thereof. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. <laughs> These scriptures start to take on a whole deeper bigger meaning when you really understand what they're saying. He's not speaking symbolically, just, oh, this is a good idea. I'm telling you, and I'm going to show you, they believe this literally. This was literal. This was not just some fancy words he's saying. They believe this literally because they understood that God wanted a place to dwell and he wanted to dwell among his people. And it's you that he want to dwell in by his spirit. 
Hey man, this is what he wanted from the beginning. That's why you don't ever see nobody building no temple for thousands and thousands of years because he got what he wanted and people, they understood. Hey Amen. So God wants the glory out of your body. He wants you to live like he's on the inside, just like in the beginning of time. Hey Amen. Hebrews 3 and 5, and Moses barely was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope. Firm unto the end. Amen. Second Corinthians 6 and 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. If God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So this is what the apostles believe. This is what he's saying. You are it. I will dwell in them. They believe this was prophecy fulfilled. First Peter, ain't just Paul, this Peter now. He also has lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Wherefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So the thing you have to do is you got to believe the scriptures like the apostles did. The Bible says that they remembered the scripture. And here they are remembering these other scriptures. They're getting scriptures from Isaiah. They're getting scriptures from Zechariah. They're getting scriptures from Ezekiel. And they're remembering like, that's what he meant by that. That's why he said what he said. That's why the scripture says that. And like the light is coming on in their mind and in their heart when they're understanding the significance of what has actually happened on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They actually get it. And the light comes on. And that's why they keep saying, the most high don't dwell in the simple made with hands. We get it. We get what he wanted from the beginning. Amen. There's other key scriptures, many, many other scriptures that deal with this subject and deal with the understanding of what New Testament teaching actually was and what they actually believed in the first century, second century church. Amen. Now we get to New Jerusalem. Revelation 21, because again, all this stuff is succinct. Everything is synced together. God knew exactly what he wanted. He knew it in the beginning. And when we get to the end, we're going to see the same thing. Revelation 21 and 22. And it says, when we get to new heaven and new earth, I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb of it are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, neither to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Trying to tell people, I've been saying this for almost, I don't know how long I've been preaching this now. But the temple is meant to be us. And he always wants to dwell with his people. Amen. And I'm trying to tell you and trying to help people understand that we got to give God what he wants. And what he wants is you. That's what he wants. Now, we got about 20 more minutes. I'm going to show you proof the early church did not build temples. Okay. I'm going to show you the history of the church building. And we're going to show you current church trends and the cost because we're going to summarize everything up and help you understand why the Solomon paradigm is, is, is a big deal. All right. Proof the early church did not build temples. All right. I'm going to give you some quotes from the early church, first century, second century, third century quotes from actual believers and Christian writers. This is from Clement of Alexandria. He said, the word prohibiting all sacrifices and the building of temples indicates that the almighty is not contained in anything. Now that came from 195 AD. We already see a bunch of scriptures in the Bible. So you got to remember where they get that from, where they get this mindset from. They got it from the Bible. <laughs> so they said here, he prohibits the building of temples. They felt building God a temple was prohibited. They felt it was prohibited. God doesn't want sacrifice and he wants obedience. Sacrifices are required due to disobedience. He doesn't want a building. He wants you. Here's more proof. This is from Origin, 240 AD. We refuse to build lifeless temples to the giver of all life. Our bodies are the temple of God. If anyone defies the temple of God by lust or sin, he will himself will be destroyed for acting impiously towards the true temple. Of all the temples spoken of in this sense, the best and most excellent was the pure and holy body of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. This he said of the temple, his body. When they reproach us for not deeming it necessary to worship the divine being by raising lifeless temples, we set before them our temples. I always love that quote. 
he says it clearly. We don't even build temples to the giver of all life. Our bodies are the temple of God. They knew this. They already, they, they got the New Testament understanding. And he said, and when they reproach us, so they were being reproached by people in the world, like, where's the temples to your God at then? You serve God. Where your temples at? He said, when they reproach us for not deeming it necessary to worship God by raising temples, we set before them our temples. In other words, we set before them our body. Like, you know what? If you want to crucify me, you want to persecute me, I set my body before you because this is the temple. I'm trying to tell you, they had, they had this thing down. They had it down. Here's another quote. You say that we build no temples to the gods and do not worship their images. Do we honor him with shrines and by building temples? That's Arnobius. That was around 300 AD. Another quote. You mistakenly think we conceal what we worship since we have no temples or altars. Yet how can anyone make an image of God? Man himself is the image of God. How can anyone build a temple to him when the whole world can't contain him? Even I, a mere human, travel far and wide. So how can anyone shut up the majesty, the majesty of so great a person within one small building? Isn't it better for him to be dedicated in our minds and consecrated in our innermost hearts rather than in a building? Now, this is from Mark Felix, second century. This is 200 AD. This is 150 years roughly after time of Paul. You know, look at the stuff they're saying. <laughs> I mean, so I'm telling you, you can't read the New Testament and read, no, you're not, you took the Holy God, Holy Ghost, and read all that and just think they're talking symbolically, like, oh, that's just symbolic. No, they believe this. And this is why you don't see no temples being built in the early church, in the apostle, uh, in the in, in, in when the apostles were doing their ministry. Amen. They knew prophecy was fulfilled and they wanted to give God what he wants. Here's another quote. You are in the habit of labeling us with a very serious charge of ungodliness for the following reasons. We do not construct temples for ceremonies of worship. We do not set up statues and images, and we, we do not build altars. Neither do we offer incense, sacrificial meals, or the blood of slain creatures. Okay, so he says here they didn't do that either. So when and where did they meet? Here's a quote that explains where they met, <laughs> where each one chooses and can. Do you suppose that we are all accustomed to meet together in one place? Quite other, otherwise, for the God of the Christians is not confined by place, but being invisible, he fills the heaven and earth, and the faithful everywhere adore him and sing his praise. That's from 160 AD. They believe God was in all places. They can they could meet anywhere they wanted, and they worshiped him. Amen. This is how they thought. All right. Here is a picture of they call the first church. So they'll say the first temple, first Christian temple. They'll say is this one. But it wasn't a temple. It was a house church. 232 AD. When they excavated that site, it was a house. They were meeting at somebody's house. Just like we see in the scripture. They were meeting in people's houses. Amen. So where did the church temples come from? All right. It's this guy right here. Our main man, Constantine. All right. And so if you don't know the story of Constantine, Constantine was an emperor of Rome. Uh, in 312 AD, Constantine became the leader of the Western Empire. Okay. And the Bible, and not the Bible, the history says he was very sympathetic to Christians. Now, why was that? Well, because he went to war. Um, you know, they did a lot of warring back then. And before he went to war, it said that he saw a symbol in the sky. He said he saw this symbol, which is the, the chiro, this P with this X on it, right? And he said he saw that in the sky. And he said that. He believed that it was the sign for the Christian God, as we say, because he wasn't Christian. He wasn't somebody like that. And so he's had that symbol put on his soldiers, soldiers' shields, and they went to battle, and they won. And then it said that, history says that he kind of vacillated whether he thought it was God, the Christian God, or was it the sun God, Math Mithras. Amen. And so what he ended up doing was just saying, you know what, uh, we're going to... Stop persecuting Christians because I don't know if it was the Christian God or the sun God, Mithras, that helped me win this war. But he became very, very empathetic towards Christians after that because up until that time, they were being persecuted. They were being persecuted by the empire. They were blaming stuff on them when things went wrong. They blamed the Christians because they say, you know, the Christians are the reason because, you know, they don't worship our gods and our gods are mad at us and they're they're punishing us because these Christians aren't, you know, bowing down to our in our temples and different things like that. And so 
he basically had this vision and he became very empathetic to Christian and he stopped and outlawed the persecution. Now that's a great thing. He outlawed the persecution for all Christians and ordered the return of property. Okay. And the big thing that he also did was he began to endorse Christianity. Okay. He began to endorse and back it. All right. Now you got to remember, this is a faith that was dwelling in houses that was in the marketplace that was being preached in the street. And now you have a king, an emperor backing it. That's a big shift. And so there's a lot of things that shifted when that happened. Amen. That's when we begin to see the temples come in. So one of the things that he did when he first began backing Christianity was he said, you know what? Why y'all, y'all ain't got no, y'all, y'all look kind of weak. How y'all doing? We kind of see the same thing happen with Solomon. Man, this is the, you know, because if this is going to be an official state religion or an endorsed religion of Rome, it's got to look like it. It's got to look a lot better than what it looked. Because right now, y'all don't look that great. <laughs> you know, because y'all ain't got no temples. Y'all ain't got no, you know, real nice spots to, to hang out. And so what he did was he began to dedicate basilicas to the church. He began to donate these temples to the church. All right. And this is a Roman basilica here. All right. And so that's what he began to do. And these were basically already built temples. They were pagan temples. These were temples already dedicated to other guys. He said, well, guess what? Now we're going to flip it and we, we, it's going to be yours. And so he gave these bishops power, the leaders of these churches, and he gave them temples. Okay. And this is when we see the temple era begin and the whole thing about coming to temples. And so when he did that, not only did he give them temples, but he also began to endorse it, like I said. And so then a lot of people started to just come to church because in the early church, you know, they had a kind of a, a path that they would do, which is where they would disciple people in the marketplace. They would meet you, do discipleship with you, get you baptized, and then you would be brought into the fellowship. It was it was very um, unique in that way. And this is why we see Paul even talking the way he talked in first Corinthians seven, when he's saying, you know, that you guys are holy, the, the church is holy. Your congregation is holy. They, they had a different perspective of the congregation. And so they didn't just let anybody come into a fellowship like that. It wasn't, it wasn't like we see today where Sunday comes up, anybody can come to church. Okay. That's when that started was when Constantine kind of endorsed it. That's when people started just coming to church. Because now they have a public building and people were allowed to just come in. So you had people that were you know, coming from other religions and whatever, and they were just coming to these basilicas on Sunday. Okay. And that's the reason why they were meeting on Sunday. Another reason why is because he also uh, believed in dedication to the sun god Mithras. All right. That's a whole nother discussion. But so another thing about the basilicas is, you know, these temples had a name. Right. So before they were given to Christians, they had names. So it might have been um, dedicated to Jupiter or whoever else. And so basically they just changed the names of the temples. And so <laughs> that's why you have St. Peter's Basilica. Right. Because in the, in the pagan uh, mind, they built these temples on they believe build, you should build temples on top of, of dead bodies or on top of people, because that's what made it sacred. That would make it a holy space. Okay, which is a pagan uh, ideology of how they do things. And so St. Peter's Basilica is supposedly built on top of St. Peter. This goes all the way back to Rome. This is all stuff that they believed back at that time. And this is when we see the influx of these buildings coming into the church, uh, the church. Okay. And so it's interesting when you understand this, because then you can see, because sometimes people ask, well, where do we get all that stuff from? Well, it all goes back to the same period. It all goes back to the same time period around 300 AD because for 300 years, they weren't doing that. And I read the quotes showing you they didn't even believe in that, okay? And so you have something called the cathedra, which is the bishop's chair, okay? This was mean, the cathedra means from the throne. By design, this was a very pompous seat reserved for the bishop. Apparently a sermon was preached from this chair with the elders surrounding it. This is all pagan temple carryover. And a lot of churches still have this set up today, okay? So this is where the whole bishop's chair come in, all right? And this all came from Rome at that time. This all came from pagan temples. Because we don't see that in the Bible. We don't see no bishop's chair in the scripture. We don't even see that in the law and the prophets. We don't see this stuff. So we got to ask, where did it come from? Well, that's where it came from, okay? And so this stuff was all carryover stuff from that period, from these temples, okay? 
All the stuff came from that. The garments, four main periods can be distinguished in the development of priestly of Christian priestly dress. The first embraces the area era before Constantine. So before Constantine, who was the man I just talked about, who changed a lot of things, in the period before then, it says right here in yellow, the dress of daily life was worn at the offices of the church. So basically, they just wore regular, regular clothes, just like the apostles did, just like Christ did. They were wearing regular clothes, okay? And it said before then, that's how they did things. But after the fact, that's when you see the garments come in. And the interesting thing about the garments uh, is that these garments were actually originally garments that was worn by Roman government officials. And so, again, we see more carryover because, again, Constantine is saying, guess what? I'm endorsing Christianity. I'm giving you the temples. And the way I want my kingdom to work is I want to have bishops over all these different cities and all these different zones. And they all report up the ladder to me. I'm at the top. I'm the hierarchy. I'm the guy at the top. And all these bishops report up this line to me because that's also different. OK, that's also different than the early church. because The early church believed in multiple eldership overseeing congregations. And so he switched it and it was more so endorsed to be hierarchical, okay, which is very, you know, reminiscent of what we see even today in government. You know, you have mayors and you have uh, governors and, you know, and then you have, you know, they all report up to the, to the president, right? It's it's the same thing. He, he, that's what he established and they all had clothes to go with it. So that's where the clothing comes from. It's not, it's not from the New Testament. It's not from anything by design. Now, some people say, well, God gave them garments in the law and the prophets. And different things like that. And that's true. He did give them garments. He did give them a holy garments. But again, if we look at the New Testament example, we don't see that. We don't see them doing that in the New Testament. And so this is where those garments came from. And it wasn't until roughly the seventh century that garb became actually sacred, where people felt that the garb was sacred. Okay, so this is the seventh, hey, this is like hundreds of years after. Okay, but they were started to be accepted as sacred objects. Okay. And this was a rationalization really to justify the practice, okay? Now, again, I'm not sitting up here saying people, you know, are wrong for doing this stuff. And work, because I used to wear the robe and wear the collar and all that, and some of y'all still do. I'm letting you know where it comes from because people have asked, where did it come from? We don't get good answers. I'm telling you where it came from. And I want people also to understand that because sometimes we put a lot of over-rationalization on these things as if, this is what God wanted us to do. But again, I'm telling you what he wanted. I'm showing you in the scriptures, okay? Because a lot of the things that we are making requirements are simply just traditions. They really are. They're just traditions of things that we do, all right? Clerical collars came later. That came from the Church of England, okay? So that came around the 18th century. So that wasn't definitely nothing they were doing way back then. But that came around the 18th century. That became a practice for that church. And that was also carry over. And then lastly, dressing up for church. Dressing up for church didn't happen until the 18th century. People couldn't afford these clothes, y'all. Dressing up for social gatherings was, was reserved for the wealthy. Many early theolog theologians urged believers to avoid costly array and dress moderately. All right. And we see that even in scripture. He said, if you have respect unto him that wear the gay clothing or the great clothing and saying to him, sit down in the good place and say to the poor, stand over here or sit here on my footstool. He's basically saying we're hypocrites, right? First Timothy two and nine in a like manner. Also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame, faithness, and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly wear. So, is this to say if you wear nice clothes, you wrong? No, it's not saying that either. I'm just showing you where it came from, <laughs> and that it wasn't early church, and it was not original. This is all newer stuff that has come on the scene. So we can't let people make a requirement and say, well, you know, you're not godly because you didn't wear, you know, you didn't wear these really nice clothes and all that. We make those requirements for people. These are just traditions. These are just customs that we have at different ministries. All right. But again, we want to understand what has been ordained and what has been sustained by God. Amen. And again, it's not saying you dress up for church, something's wrong with you. I'm just showing you where it came from. Amen. We're showing you when these things came on the scene. And so the key thing to remember is it's what it's what's on the inside that counts. That's the key. It's what is on the inside because he always wanted to dwell in his people. All right. Now, finishing up this, we got to see how much it costs. What does the Solomon paradigm cost the body? What does it cost the church? So here's the key. Our culture has it backwards a little bit. 
first thing when you look at this picture, this is not a church. This is not the house of God. This is not a fellowship. Okay. What is a church? We read what the church was. Bible says the church is the ecclesia, the called out peoples. Okay. That is what a church is according to the scripture. This is not the house of God. The Bible says the dwelling of God is us. Okay. And this is not a fellowship. Fellowship is the word koinonia. I talked about that last week. Koinonia means common unity, common bond. It means to share with each other and to have a common commonality with each other. That is what a fellowship means in the scripture. And it represents um, something much deeper than a building. Okay. And so the reason I'm saying that is, is this, this is an auditorium. That's what this is. Okay. The picture shows an auditorium and the definition of an auditorium is a room built to enable an audience to hear and watch performances at venues. Okay. Now, is it meaning that we shouldn't have these things and say that, but we got to watch our vernacular because again, the key thing we want to be as believers is we want to say the things the right way. We want to align what we say with the scriptures. We can't say we believe the scriptures and then don't do what the scriptures say, or we do something different than what the scripture said. All right. The Bible calls us the church, calls us the house of God, and it does not, and it calls us the believers together the fellowship. And so if these are the things that cause a fellowship, then what you're looking at in this picture is an auditorium. It's just a place where people meet. That's what it is. And so this is how you have to think about it, because again, what ends up happening is people don't look at it that way. They think when they go build this, they're building the house of God. They believe that this is what God wants. They believe this is what God's telling us to do. And they, they take a much different approach, which is very similar to what Solomon did. And what it does is it, it basically kind of devalues what was being preached in the New Testament and in the early church, because now it's saying, well, you know, we can't really have a place to, we can't have a place to worship unless we, you know, unless we have a place we can dedicate to God, because I'm going to Solomon, I'm looking at his example, right? And again, I've read and showed you the quotes, I've read and showed you the scriptures, that are showing that they believe differently. They believe these things very differently. And so we have to say what the scripture says, and we have to look at things the way the scripture does, because whatever God does is sustainable. I'm telling you, it's sustainable. Why? What becomes of church buildings? As beautiful as they are, they always end up bricks in a pile of bricks. Now, I've got a couple pictures here just to kind of show. These are a lot of different church you know, buildings of, of, of different time periods. I think this is actually just Detroit. And when you look at all these buildings, they're all beautiful. They're gorgeous, gorgeous buildings, right? And here's some of the historical pictures of this particular one, but this is how I look now. This is how I looked before. This is how I look now. This is how I was before. This is how I look now. Okay? And the reason I'm showing it is it's hard. It's a hard truth. It's great when it's there, but eventually this is how they end up. And the funny thing about it is if, if the greatest temple ever built, which is Solomon's temple, couldn't even make it, I don't know how much great we're going to do with it. Okay. And so this is a ploy or this is a, a call to the people of God really to say, you have to understand what the scripture of hope. Okay. It's not saying you can't build. Uh, a place and have a place to worship God. It's never about that. It's not what I'm talking about. That's not the purpose of this lesson. The purpose of this lesson is for you to understand that what God wanted was actually something greater than this. And that, yes, we can have a place to meet. We can have a place to come together and clap our hands and worship God. But understand what he ultimately wants <laughs> is us. Not, not that. This is not what he wants us to do. Like, this is what my whole calling is. This is my whole purpose. I want people to build me this big. That's not how he's approaching salvation. That's not how he's approaching the church. And that's why I said earlier, these buildings are not sustainable because they're just bricks. They're just bricks and building. We end up spending millions and millions of dollars on these things and they end up all like this eventually. Amen. And so just to kind of give you a flip side of it, you know, you can build a building for $50,000. It may not look like that, <laughs> but if you want a space to meet at, it don't cost that much. It just doesn't. And a lot of times what we're doing is we're going with the wrong paradigm, the wrong train of thinking. And we go in and we spend millions and millions and millions. 
And these things are not going to be sustainable long-term. I've talked to church leaders. I've talked to pastors. And it's so funny because what kind of hurt me a little bit, not really hurt me, but just kind of um, made me, well, first off, I thank God because when I, when I began to launch out and do ministry, you know, this is one of the first things he showed me and revealed to me when I was in my desert, when I was in my quiet time, when I was just, he said, don't, I'm going to show you the truth about that. I'm going to show you the truth about temples. I'm going to show you the truth about some of the practices we do today. And that's why I had to go sit down. I had to do like Paul. I had to go sit down and get the ministry for me because I was like, if I'd have left and did it the same way, I'd have went out and just did the same thing. I went out and, you know, you do the same thing over again. He's like, I'm going to show you something different. And I thank God because I'm going to show you the trajectory right now for churches and the way these things are going. It's just going to be different. We already see the membership decline and attendance declining. And that era of that phase is losing its luster. And there's a lot of money that's already been invested in these things. And again, as I said, these things are not sustainable. Okay. The cost, $50 billion in revenue generated annually from church members. Most of that revenue is used to maintain the corporate corporate aspect of those churches. Along with annual revenue, churches hold a combined real estate asset valued in the billions of dollars. <clears throat> According to a 2013 study, study by the Evangelical Credit Union, 82% of church budgets were allocated towards salaries, real estate, mortgages, building, ground maintenance, office and building supplies, Insurance, utility, security, marketing and advertisement, multimedia production equipment, technology, internet and cable, and many other expenses. That's 82% of the budgets. Okay. So we have a very high overhead for this. And so a very high overhead requires a lot of money to continue to let it go. Amen. And that's why you get some of the doctrines that we've gotten with giving, you know, because some of the doctrines that have been taught on giving are not biblical as well, but I don't have time to get into that. But that's how people come up with new stuff, like come up with using the scripture to come up with a new new way of getting your money and stuff. Because, again, we have a much, much high overhead that has to be supported. And again, if we just simply go back to the simplicity of the scripture and the simplicity of the way the apostles approach ministry, where the money they were collecting was going to people. When it was going to the people that needed, they were collecting money, giving it to the poor, giving it to people in the ministry. They would collect money and make sure nobody had any lack. They were having people sell lands and homes to, to lay it at the apostles' feet so they could all have things in common. This is just something very different. And so this is why it should be challenging to us because, again, are we doing what God wants or are we doing what we want or we think what we are we doing what he think he wants? Amen. And so questions we need to address. If the church members pay for the building, who owns it? If it's sold, do they get the proceeds back? Who's on the deed? Can members utilize the resources at the church? Is the building held in common? Now, as I read earlier, you know, the Bible says they had all things in common in the scripture. So if they all pay for the building, should they not be able to utilize the resources or the building held in common? So these are all questions we got to ask because what we're seeing is a different model that's that that's really not supported very strong scripturally. Okay, there's a lot of things about it where you have to question. And these things are starting to come to uh to light in our day because again, you know, as I said, that system is not typically sustainable long-term. We see it do well for a little bit of time and then it kind of fall off. It do well for a little bit of time and then it fall off. And again, as I said earlier, we had 300 years of history of them not building a temple and the whole, the whole country of Rome was turned upside down. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And one of the reasons it happened that way is because it's like when you, when you align yourself with that model, it's like you're, you shift, your whole focus of ministry in a different direction and you establish something much different. Okay. And again, please hear what I'm saying. I am not saying people cannot have a place to meet. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the mindset that the only way to do ministry is to build a church first and then have people come there and meet. That is not <laughs> New Testament theology. That is just a different model of thinking. And the, and the problem with it also is, is that it, it it makes people think that's what ministry only is, right? So you have people that may have in them the idea to, to go start a monastery or to go build a hospital 
or to go, you know, build a school or to go. There's so many other things you can do with kingdom mindset. You can go buy land, you know, and, and, and you know, we could be buying land and, and, and investing in the kingdom and being able to take the food. He said, occupy till I come. I'm going to give you the talents, but go and he said, employ them until I come. We have many talents that could be employed, but we suck the resources all into one spot. And so this is a significant thing to deal with as we talk about kingdom sustainability, because number one, we can see many, many examples of where it wasn't sustained long-term. And number two, it gets in the way in a way of, of taking people's mind to think this is what we're all supposed to be doing all the time. This is it. And I challenge you to think otherwise. Man, I'm not going to go through all these different stats. I think that was pretty much it. But this is the summary. And I'm glad I got it done at 830. Summary. We are trying to get people into a system a lot don't find important for knowing God. Now, that was kind of covered in the stats, you know, where you can see that the statistics show even here, this is old, but attendance was going down back in early 2000, okay? Um, but budgets here in the second line were going up. So budgets are going up, but attendance is going down. Because again, I understand it. You know, we want a place to meet people. We want to have a place to bring people to, to worship and to, you know, do ministry. That's good. That's fine. But why is the operating budget going up and the attendance going down? That's not a good projector. Even if you was just a business mind, that's not the correct projector. So the key thing to take away is it doesn't take all that. It just doesn't. It doesn't take as much money as we spend on it. That's the problem. We should not be spending as much money on this stuff as we spend. You can go build a, 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 a 40 by 60 metal building and get it for air conditioned and probably get that built for about $80,000. And a 40 by 60 building, you can get that built for $80,000. And it can be built in probably 30 days. And I'm telling you, and you can pack people in there. And and that's what, that's what we have to think. Why do we spend as much as we spend when we don't have to? Then you can utilize the resources for much better things, like helping people out, taking care of folks, you know, doing real ministry stuff. Amen? So in summary... We're trying to get people into a system that a lot don't find as important for knowing God. Now, some of the stats show that when you they did a survey with people in our generation and even our younger generation, they weren't even under they they didn't really see the value in it at all. And that's why they ain't going. They like, why do we gotta have that? You know, and I know there's some thoughts behind that too, because sometimes people think, well, they just don't want to go to church. They don't want to, you know, and there's some, you know, truth to that. There's some pieces there that have to be deciphered. But a big piece of it is, is that, you know, people are not looking at that in the way that the people that are building it are. And again, a lot of times you hear people say, well, I want to do it because I want to get people to come and I'm want to allow have this spot for people to feel comfortable coming to. And it's like, but then when you look at the stats and look at the survey, that's not what people even saying they want in the first place. And so a lot of times what we have to realize is this is what we want. This is what we want our legacy to be. This is what we want to do. <laughs> hey man, one of the things I really pray about, I say, God, look, I don't want to be doing what I want to do. I don't, matter of fact, I even give you a truth when I'm wrapping it up. <clears throat> I've been praying, I pray about this all the time. I say, God, you know, do you want me to go out here and do ministry a certain way? Do you, I, I, I know what I preached on, I know what I said, but guess what? I believe the truth. If, if you tell me something and that ain't what you I saw before and it's something different, then I'm going to change what I got to do. That's just what I got to do. It might be hard. And yeah, I got to go. I have to go and unpreach what I taught the first time. But it's okay because at the end of the day, we should just want to be right and want to be truthful with what we do. Amen. And I and, and and several times he showed me many times, don't go do what they do. Don't go build a church. Don't go <laughs> don't go start doing the same thing. He keeps telling that. Sometimes he showed me not to do it when I didn't even ask. Like, now I ain't even asked about it. This time you showed me again. And so I know he's showing me <laughs> to to employ this word to help shift the focus of people because where we are going, we can't have this same thought. We can't have the same paradigm. We have to be thinking beyond where we are. And as I showed you historically, this was not the way they did things. This is something that was different and it is not the de facto system. Okay. 
We are spending a lot of money on this system, even though people are attending less. We must rethink our strategy to bring people into the church. We can't rely on current methods to grow the body. We feel it's absolutely necessary to get a building to start a church, but not one apostle ever did that. And so that's what I'm ending with there. When we talk about the Solomon paradigm, we're talking about it in relation to the sustainability of the kingdom. And that, again, whatever God does is sustainable and it's forever. Amen. And that, again, what he established was a much better covenant where he's saying, guess what? Look, wherever I'm at, I'm, that's where I, wherever you at, that's where I want to be because my spirit is going to dwell in you. And wherever you go, you can affect all types of things. You can change atmospheres. You can change dimensions and domains. You got so much power in you as sons and daughters of God. We really begin to grab hold of what the scripture really is saying. It's amazing what you'll be able to do. And if you really grab hold to how they believe the scripture, how they view God, how they view who they were. When, by, when John is talking about now you are the sons of God, <laughs> you got to understand what they meant when they were saying that because they said Christ was the firstborn, right? But now he's saying, but now we are as well. And so what they're implying, and that's why Christ is saying, greater works are you going to do because I'm going to the Father. And they, and he, that's why they're talking about we're joint heirs with Christ. Like the reason they're saying these things is they had a different perspective of who we are and who we were called to be and what we are capable of. Amen. And this is why they approached ministry the way they did. And I also believe this is why they had the success that they had. 